Doc receives you're at 32, they're going to say, you're you, know, okay. let, you know, keep up the good work. Right. When in reality, that's a, a deficiency. The average American, by the way, is 30. So there, people are coming in in droves at 30 and the doctors are come, kicking them out and saying like, this is great, everything looks good. But as soon as you get below 50, you start to see all kinds of associations with all kinds of health issues, from gut issues to chronic fatigue to depression sometimes. You see just so many issues. I was looking at your YouTube channel just earlier today, and there was a really fascinating video that really informed me on five health benefits of sunshine. I love mm. sunshine. I'm here in beautiful Miami Beach, Florida, the sunshine state. And you talked about these five benefits. So I'd love for you to get into these five benefits and why it's so important to get sunshine. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I do DNA consulting as well. And um, when I when I look at people's DNA, it's through 23andMe and Ancestry. But you notice a lot of interesting genetic risks that are dependent on sunshine and basically fixed by for people getting out in the sun. So I'm constantly saying, look, you know, you've got these vitamin D receptor issues. You need to get more vitamin D, get out in the sun or take vitamin D or both. But then it goes way beyond that because that's what everybody talks about when they talk about the benefits of sunshine. But they, there's also like, there's a gene called UGT1A1. And I mentioned that gene in the YouTube video, even though it's really simple and basic and the idea is so normal people can understand, but this gene, it's involved in breaking down bilirubin. And that's important. And a lot of people don't, I mean, maybe have never even heard of bilirubin, but some people have a genetic issue where it's really, really high. And all you got to do is get out in the sun. It breaks that down in your skin and your body clears it out. And by the way, if that builds up really high, it can call, it can cause gallstones and surgeons love to take out your gallbladder if you've got mm -hmm. gallstone and permanently basically destroy your fat you know metabolism or fat you know then you're kind of messed up for the rest of your life in terms of eating fat you're at least behind the eight ball you have to do you know ox bile supplements and all mm -hmm. kinds of other things but uh billy rubin's another reason to get out in the sun even if you're not outrageously high you know like just how, like increase your body's metabolism of billy rubin that's two things um and of course again vitamin b vitamin D being very obvious and common, but, um, another one was toxin breakdown and removal. And the example I used in the video was tattoos mm -hmm. because, you know, laser removal of tattoos literally zaps, uh, those heavy metal particles. So they're injecting when you're putting a tattoo in, you're injecting heavy metals in just underneath your skin. And sometimes these are pretty nasty, heavy metals. I mean, it can include mercury and cadmium and chromium and, it's quite a lot of them. So, you know, there's always kind of this detox period, but those heavy metals are usually in big enough chunks where your immune system cannot engulf them and clear them out. So they stay under skin, but you know, if you have tattoos, you're probably familiar. They tell you put on sunscreen, block the sun from the tattoos because sunshine, just like laser removal, it actually zaps those large chunks of heavy metals and breaks them into smaller chunks and then your immune system can clear them out and so then your tattoo fades away over time uh, so that's you know less attractive and then also it's less healthy because now you're getting more heavy metal constantly just streaming into your system and it goes beyond that with sunshine because even if you don't have tattoos the uv from sunshine literally helps you to break up various toxins that are under your skin just naturally building up from different environmental exposures or just like proteins that are misfolded that are maybe you know uh conglomerates of proteins that are oxidized and you know there's a lot going on with sunshine in terms of detox so another important benefit and then there's a really cool benefit probably my favorite and i think i'm only on like number four but i guess people <laughs> could watch the video for number five because i can't even think of number five but <laughs> My favorite one, just to finish it up, is um, the melanotan receptor. It's called MC4R. And I think I mentioned this in the video. I can't remember. You could correct me. But I actually bought some melanotan yeah, and, in and injected it. Sure that, yeah, and you were hungry all the yeah. time, no? Exactly. So it made me really hungry because my metabolism went way up. And I only did three injections, and I was tan for a whole month. So it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of funny because I was in Minnesota in the winter. And you can tell if you're looking at me, I definitely don't get tan <laughs> um, without at least a lot of adaptation, really slow mm -hmm. introduction to the sun. So um, that's another benefit of sunshine. It literally 
increases your body's natural production of melanotan, you don't have to go inject it. You can just naturally increase by getting out in the sun and it increases your metabolism. So you burn more calories all throughout the day. You don't have to do cardio. You're just burning more calories across the board. So really good benefit of sunshine right there that you never hear about. So fascinating. And one of the other uh, benefits was mood improvement, right? Uh, and you exactly. talked about seasonal effect, uh, seasonal uh, SAD, right? What, uh, what exactly. was the disorder? Yeah, yeah. What, seasonal affective disorder. Yeah. Seasonal affective yeah. disorder. Exactly. So uh, well, how does it help with mood improvement? Uh, you have receptors on your skin. So there's a gene, for example, it's called OPN4. There's another one called PER3. There's a few different genes that some people have more disposition for this. And again, when I do these DNA consults, that's what I'm looking for, those genes. Mm -hmm. And um, so some people, they're pretty resilient to being in really dark, you know, up in Alaska in the winter or whatever, seasonally dark areas. But um, other people, it's really depressing for them and they get clinical depression or at least they just feel lousy. And it's because these receptors aren't getting sunshine. And honestly, even going to a tanning bed helps. You know, a lot of people can't afford to fly down to Mexico or Florida for a couple of weeks in the winter and do this, you know, like just basically regenerate their mood through these receptors and through the sunshine. So at least you can use a tanning bed. Obviously, don't get burned. Just go in there for like three minutes. Burning is the opposite of healthy. It's infl inf it's chronic inflammation you're creating. But, you know, if you go in there three to five minutes and you just get some some ultraviolet on your skin, that helps, too. What about the role with uh, vitamin D and cholesterol? Yeah, so cholesterol is converted uh, via the sunshine to vitamin D. So yeah, I mean, anytime you anytime you go higher fat diet, your cholesterol usually goes up, and that's usually a good thing, because my in my opinion, the optimal total cholesterol is between about two twenty and about two sixty for men and women, um, or, or is that correct? Men? Oh for yeah, both. both. Got it. Yep. And, um, and they've, they've distinguished between those two. In fact, if you want to be less specific, I'd say anywhere between 180 and 280 is a double thumbs up as far as I'm concerned. If you're lower than that, like if you're a vegan and you're not eating a lot of fats and your cholesterol is 120, and I'm just talking total cholesterol because that's what the doctors love to talk about. Mm -hmm. If your total cholesterol is 120, the doctor will come into the office and he'll pat you on the back and he'll say, I'm so proud of you. Keep up the good work. You are the the absolute model of good health. And yeah, your testosterone is also 120 instead of 600. And yeah, you have no energy and no sex drive, but look at your cholesterol. I'm so pleased. <laughs> so ridiculous, dude. I, I actually read it. I remember reading a study. Maybe you could, you, maybe you know the study that more people actually die from heart disease with normal to low cholesterol than with high cholesterol. Have you seen that as well? Oh yeah, for sure. And to be honest, you know, as long as you're, if you start getting to three, 400, some people are at 600. I mean, yeah, there's some problems there, especially with your triglycerides. I met a guy this last year at deer hunting camp. He's like a family. Uh, I hunt with this family and it was like an extension of their family. And his, his triglycerides were 900. Wow. And you're supposed to be like below 100. I mean, I let's know. be honest. Jeez. <laughs> so his blood is literally like like grease. I mean, and my dad talks about that because so my, my dad is a doctor. My brother's an orthopedic surgeon and they'll talk about like, yeah, if you're doing surgery and somebody just ate pizza or something, their blood will be greasy. Like if, if, you, if you're eating somebody who's eating like seed oils and fast food and stuff, it's physically greasy. It's gross if your triglycerides are that high. So his, um, his triglycerides were that high because of probably seed oils, vegetable oils, and carbohydrates and sugar. It's just the, the inflammatory exactly. foods, right? And no exercise on top of all that. Mm. Yeah, you can't get that high. I mean, that's like Guinness Records high. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. You know, I, yeah, I recently did I recently did a uh, carnivore forty day carnivore protocol last summer. Yeah, and I did. Cool. I did. I did a whole bunch of lab work on day one. I got my LDL particles, NMR profile, HDL triglycerides. I got my C reactive protein, homocysteine. I did a comprehensive panel on day one, and then I ate nothing but animal fat and cholesterol from animals for forty days, and then I did it on day forty. And yeah, my cholesterol went up, my LDLs went up as well, but everything else improved. My my C reactive protein was at 1.1 on day one. It went down to 0 0.5 on day 40. My homocysteine Perfect. was like 6.5, went down to five on day 40. Uh, my A1C dropped a point. My fasting insulin also improved. I mean, I saw all these improvements, right? So it flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which says, which says if you're eating all that fat and cholesterol from animal products, you're going to increase your risk of heart disease with, I just did, I saw the exact opposite. So I'm sure you've exactly. seen that before. 
Oh, hundred percent. Well, I did my PhD on cholesterol, you know, and oh. what's sad is most of the people in that field, they're taking statins, even though the research is very obvious that like how damaging they are and how, and what the optimal levels should be for your, I mean, if people want to look at a study, there's a study called total cholesterol and all cause mortality. And it had 12.8 million people. If you just search, Google search, quote unquote, total cholesterol, all cause mortality, 12.8 million people, you'll find the study and look at figure two in that study and you'll see the optimal levels for total cholesterol. The research is very clear. Now, as soon as you get ab above 200 on your total cholesterol, the doctors come into the office and they're all sweaty and they say, I'm sorry to inform you, you're going to die any minute unless we get you on some statins. <laughs> and it freaks people out, right? Like They've done this to me. That's why I know. And I take the prescription because I can't even argue with them. I have a freaking PhD on this topic. I did five years researching cholesterol. I can't sit down and show them the data and argue. I've tried that. So what I have to do now is just take the prescription, smile, shake their hand, walk out and throw it on the trash on the way out the door. That's what we've come to, you know, with the cholesterol situation. But what's even more ironic, Ben, is that if your blood sugar is above 85 fasted, that's a threefold higher risk of heart disease. Hmm. And I did a video on that on my YouTube channel also. And I mean, can you imagine how crazy it is? Because usually you come in at a 90, like Americans are coming into the office with a 95 on their blood sugar, a hundred. And the cardiologists totally ignore that. They're like, oh yeah, your labs look fine, but your cholesterol is too high. Let's jump you on some stuff. That's the only thing they focus on. And they're dropping you from the optimal range into no man's land where your testosterone is also getting hammered. Your vitamin D is getting hammered. You know, and your skin's not as well protected against the sunshine, which is a full circle back to where we started. <laughs> right. Yeah. Perfect. That's interesting. So, a three fold increase in heart disease if you have a fasting glucose consistently over 85. Yep. So, even if it's 87, 88, because from I thought 70 to 90 would be an optimal range. So, what you're saying is anything above 85 is not considered optimal. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Because I was interested in that question when I did this particular video and, and I was wondering like, what is the optimal range? What about age? You know, what about children? And it comes back really consistent just over and over in the, in all of these studies from every direction. Um, and they like to say it's between like 70 and 85, I think, but you know, the people that the studies that they look at where, where people have blood sugar of 60 and things like that are starving people on the streets and things like really poor quality group to research because they're having you know they're on sometimes on some pretty hard drugs and they're dying of really unusual causes that normal people like they're exposed to crazy cold weather or something like that right so to, to say that there's a low end to that is a little bit questionable with some mm -hmm. of that research but but yeah that's that's the cutoff because i used to say 90 all the time um i used to have it on my dna consults on the actual report that i give people make sure you're below 90. i felt like that was a pretty conservative cutoff line for optimization but 85 looks to be the number <clears throat> that's interesting yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna watch that video and look into that research because that's what i've been saying to, to 90 but now i'm curious to see some of what you're sharing. That's so fascinating. And that's another uh, important reason to have something like a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, because you could get a snapshot of exactly what's going on with your blood sugars. You know, going. let's close the loop real quick with the sunshine and the vitamin D. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look at somebody gets their vitamin D, which is not even that common, it's not on a typical lab report, you sometimes have to request it as an add-on. Mm -hmm. You see this 30 to 70 range. And if some, you know, your doctor right. sees you're at 32, they're going to say, you're you, know, okay. let, you know, keep up the good work <laughs> right. when in reality, that's a, a, a deficiency. So what are the optimal ranges for vitamin D? Have you ever seen a, a vitamin D toxicity level? I've never seen it. And just what are some of the optimal ranges? Yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes it says 30 to 70, sometimes 30 to 100. But yeah, you're exactly right. You're coming in. At, the average American, by the way, is 30. So there, people are coming in in droves at 30 and the doctors are coming kicking them out and saying like this is great everything looks good but as soon as you get below 50 on you start to see all kinds of associations with all kinds of health issues from gut issues to chronic fatigue to depression sometimes you see just so many issues uh, muscle dysfunction i mean you name it pretty much and you're going to start to see issues and a lot of the doctors when you argue with this about, the, about this topic with them they'll say well those are just associations because that's a good thing to say generally when it comes to a lot of these vegan studies and all this stuff with the diet because there's a lot of silly shenanigans going on with association studies. But with the vitamin D, my philosophy is, look, 
why be below 50 if you have even associations for you know for issues below that right. at least let's get above 50 and then we can eliminate the association risks that mm-hmm. may or may not be valid um and so they also if you look at the hunter gathering studies right hunter gathering tribes i've looked at the blood work and it's very clear everybody in those tribes is between 70 and 120 and wow. i mean everybody yeah some of the tribes it's it's between 70 and 100 some of them it's, some of them average between 80 and 120 um and so i think that's the optimal range and by the way another just a side note if you go to the doctor with an 80 they'll tell they'll come in and tell you you're toxic oh so stupid <laughs> yeah and and it i mean if you're at 200 or something there's a risk for calcifying your arteries basically even mm. even if your vitamin k is nice and high doctors do see that once in a while in their own experience so they do kind of get righteously you know worried if you're if you're legitimately like that high but there's no there's no just keep it between 50 and and 100 and i feel like you i I like to get people up to about 50 with supplements and then the sunshine it depends on the genes number one the context number two because people go out in the sun more or less but then usually they get out in the sun and they bump it up to 70 80 Mm -hmm. if they're on the sun pretty regular but I mean, Joseph Mercola, right? He gets up to 70, 80 with zero vitamin D supplements. He's just outside all the time. He's in your neck of the woods That's down right. in Florida. Yeah, so. exactly. So he's getting the natural sunshine, which is the best way to do it. Uh, and yeah, I, I like mine typically stays in the 65, 72 range of vitamin D. Perfect. I'll go on and off, you know, supplementation with it, but I typically get it from the sun. You know, the sun, like you said, it forces adaptation. It's a hormetic stressor. And a little bit of that, you have a good positive curve with that hormesis, but then you get too much, you get burned, then that curve goes down. So somebody like me, I could get I could get about an hour and I'm not burned. And then after that, I'm starting to get burned. Somebody like you, Anthony, you said what, yeah. 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah, so I do. I set a timer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do? You set a timer? And then what yeah, do you do? Do you it. like put you put, I put sun- a sun shirt on, I put sun gloves, I put this goofy sun hat that has this back flap on it That's... for my neck. I go crazy. <laughs> but like I fish like too, so I'll be up. Yeah, total too. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people are slathering themselves with sunscreen. What are the issues with mm. with most sunscreen out there? Yeah, it's it's insane. I mean, if you go to just Walmart and or whatever, and you just look at the sunscreens, you flip them around and look at the ingredients, and just sunscreen after sunscreen after sunscreen. The main ingredient is oxybenzone, and that's also called benzophenone three. So there's like benzophenone one, benzophenone two, benzophenone three. There's a whole bunch of benzophenones. There's a whole class of of toxin, really, frankly. It's a man-made chemical. It's fake. It's not found in nature. Our ancestors were never exposed to this. And again, a synonym is oxybenzone. Oxybenzone, benzophenone. If you see that, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, that chemical acts like estrogen in, in your body. And you don't want to be rubbing it on your skin because it goes through your skin. Now, by the way, when I wrote my book, there this was a little bit ambiguous. People you know, said, well, there's not enough studies to really conclusively show it goes through your skin. After I published my book, thank goodness they came out with a study where they they put sunscreen on people. And I mean, this made like CNN and everything. If you type in like oxybenzone dermal uptake or, you know, whatever, it was on all the major news platforms. And it was because they did one application of sunscreen. Seven days later, the levels of oxybenzone were still above the government's own safety limits Jeez. for that blood level. Yeah. And <laughs> they've never done the study before. They were saying like, oh, oops, like we need to do more research. It's like, yeah, of course you do. It's been legal for like 50 years and people have been using it like crazy on their children. And these are adults and then they're above the government's level. And by the way, the government's limits are absurd already. And I go through that in my book, right. just explaining how ridiculous those are, because what they're doing to set those up is toxicity studies. They're trying to kill cells. They're adding this, this chemical. And let's see, let's see how much it takes to kill the cells. But these estrogen chemicals, oftentimes they don't kill the cells because they act like estrogen. So the cell's like, oh yeah, this is just estrogen. And it screws up the cells. It does all kinds of weird stuff to them, especially if you put it in a body, like your body or a mouse or a rat or whatever, like some whole animal, because you're, you're screwing with the hormones holistically, but it doesn't kill the cells for quite a, you know, for, for a pretty high dose. So to get above the government's own safety limits, insane. And by the way, zinc is a great alternative. There's plenty of zinc sunscreens with, with coconut oil or whatever, like other ingredients that you can actually pronounce. <laughs> Are there any brands that come to mind for that? 
Yeah, I, on my AJ Consulting Company website, I have a page called What I Use. And I just tell people like, hey, here's the products that I use from the soaps to the detergents to the uh, shampoos. And it's not extensive by any stretch. It's just, hey, th- I found this one to be cheap, but it's also really good. I found this one you have to pay a little extra money for because this is the only one I could find. Um, awesome. And sunscreen, I have like three or four different sunscreens on there because I've tested like 20 or 30 of them and because I fish a lot. <laughs> <laughs> In well, Minnesota? I'll, yeah, I fish. Well, I'm like, I'm going to be down in the Keys this June fishing for tarpon during the migration oh, and nice. mahi mahi. And, and then I'm out in Washington, Oregon, uh, coming up soon, fishing. Uh, actually, in April here, April 15, there's the white sturgeon migration. They have these thousand pound fish. They call them poor man's marlin. <laughs> and they jump out of the water. Like when you hook them, they come flying out of the water. Wow. And they're, they're insane. So, like, I'll go outside and fish all day long you know, day after day. And so I can try like, well, let me try this sunscreen on this arm and this one on this arm. And it's surprising. Sometimes I get burned with the same, the the ingredients look pretty much identical, 20% zinc, pretty similar ingredients. And then one arm will get burned. So things like that help me to kind of narrow it down or deodorant. I did that with deodorant, lots of different deodorant tests because most of the natural ones didn't work for me. I just could smell it. Yeah. And I was doing one arm, one arm here, one arm there. (laughs) 